All yours, Mike. Okay. If you've been to a uh, meeting of the Fine Woodworker Association in the past 20 years, you've seen Dell Cover. He's a program director and he finds interesting people who lecture and teach and um, they're always good. Uh, they're almost always interesting and every now and then when he can't find someone, Dell comes in and does a presentation himself and they are usually amazing. Um, they're always better than either regular type of, of lecturer. Um, Dell's upstairs study, I've been to his place, is a, it's a museum. It's a, you, you'll get a taste of it very shortly and you're going to love it. Um, uh, he'll show us some things and he says he's going to go into detail on a couple of items, how they're constructed, and we'll get to ask questions later. Uh, that said, I'm going to turn you over to Dell and Genevieve, and uh, they're going to take this thing from here and uh, roll with it. Well, thank you, Mike and Travis. Uh, I'm here with my daughter, Genevieve, who is also my IT person that's <laughs> arranging a lot of this for me. And, <laughs> and my wife, Maureen, that may join us a little later with some video work. Uh, also, Dave Parr has joined in from uh, Northern California, and Dave was one of the people that worked on many of these projects with Nikki. So, uh, okay. welcome, Dave. Thank uh, you, so, through the uh, benefit of modern technology here and the time machine, I am currently in Nikki's dining room in 2000 uh, <laughs> in La Jolla here. So, this is my background. Um, I am um, going to talk a little bit about my just a quick uh, history of what I do as a woodworker, but then I, I want to make this talk really about how who Nikki was, meeting her, the influence it had on my life, and the pieces that uh, myself and Dave and a few others were able to work with her on over the years. Uh, Nikki was here from San Diego from '94 to 2002 when she died. Uh, from 95 on, uh, I worked with her quite extensively on many, many different items. And many times this was very challenging. Nikki was an incredible artist, but she didn't understand wood or the mechanics or the logic of what we had to uh, do to uh, make it work. So uh, uh, everything I did for her turned out was quite a challenge. and. Uh, uh, many times involved a lot of engineering and complex solutions to make it work structurally, but to pull it off. So with that, I'm going to go to my slides here in just one second. We will have them up. They're coming up here and Here we go. Uh, here we go. Nope. I oh, that one. Okay, here we go. Let me just get these in full screen. So I started. Oh, okay. There we go. You still have your virtual background on. Okay. Yeah. I, started, I started woodworking as a model builder and boat builder. That was my first experience in woodworking. Oh. And this is a piece I did. Uh, so that came into play a lot in working with Nikki. Mm -hmm. We're going to use that. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, done rocking chairs, cradles. Uh, these were my own design. Some of you may remember this from the fair a few years ago. This is uh, using the boat building skills to do a art hammock piece, a Viking ship. Hmm. This uh, wound up on the back cover of Fine Woodworking, so got a little bit of attention. Um, I spent a lot of time down in Mexico uh, working with cave paintings down there and studying them, so I uh, did quite a few pieces where I took the cave paintings and then used woods to uh, assimilate the colors of the paintings and did uh, murals like this. Uh, this was a uh, piece I did for a friend. It's called A Breast of Drawers. You may remember that. It was in one of the first fair shows. Uh, currently, I've got another uh, piece of it uh, being built out in the shop right as we speak. 
Here's another uh, piece uh, by artwork and furniture. So in uh, 1995, I had the opportunity to meet Nikki de St. Paul. She had just moved to San Diego and uh, Nikki needed some uh, furniture pieces. She needed uh, uh, tables to work, studio tables. So I made her a series of uh, tables for her, her studio and she was impressed and said, well, can, would you like to do some artwork? I've never worked in wood before. And I said, sure. So Nikki, uh, in case you don't know who she is, she's a, a American, French and Swiss artist. She lived most of her life in Europe and in France and Italy, but she came here in her latter years for health reasons. And uh, one of the first pieces, just her San Diego pieces that people may know of was the Sun God she did for the Stewart Collection at UCSD. This was in 1983 and it was the first piece that started the Stewart Collection, which is all the art pieces on campus now. There's about, I think, 19 pieces. Uh, another piece she did while she was here was called Coming Together. And this is a large statue uh, down by the south end of the convention center. Uh, right in front of this now is the ballpark. Uh, the guardian angel that hangs in the Mingay, when it, uh, which is closed for remodeling right now, but will be going back up. So prior to coming here for 20 years, Nikki lived in Italy. She always wanted to do a Gade type garden and so she came up with the idea of doing a garden. This is more than 20 acres based on, each piece is based on the tarot cards. Uh, in some of these pieces, they're buildings. They're not just art sculpture pieces, single sculpture pieces, they're large pieces. This building was the Sphinx. Uh, during the construction of this, Nikki lived inside. She lived, her bedroom was actually the left breast. Uh, all the coverings on this is handmade mosaics and tiles that were made by the artists in Italy. Uh, this is the inside of that building. Everything inside of it wow. is mirrored. Uh, at night, you can uh, read by one candle. It's just, it's phenomenal the effect it has. Uh, one of the first pieces she asked me to do was the chariot. So I did this, the wood core of this piece that went over there and then got covered in tile and painted by the artists there. Um, Nikki was also working on a piece with Mario Boto, the French art, uh, I'm sorry, Swiss architect. Mario, um, if you don't know him, he's a uh, architect, a lot of his stuff's in Europe, but here he's known for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And he was currently doing a uh, gal, uh, gallery in Basel, Switzerland for Nikki's uh, ex-partner, Jean Tingley. So they were going to do Noah's Ark, but Nikki, everybody does Noah's Ark with the animals boarding. Nikki thought it'd be more fun to do it with the animals after they've been to sea for 40 days and nights. So these were some of the first study pieces for that. And these were lamps that we did. I would uh, sculpt these in wood, just simple carved poplar, whatever, and then they would be painted by her artists there. These were some of the first study pieces. I believe Dave and I both worked on these uh, for Noah's Ark. And these are about typically two to three inches big. Uh, the dove down in the foreground is maybe at three quarters of an inch across. You'll notice in these, uh, this is alligator. You'll see this in a minute and this lion. These were the first study pieces to just get an idea. These were gonna be uh, outdoor pieces that people could climb on. Uh, now this is a larger maquette of the lion. This is about six to eight inches across and Nikki's people in the studio there have painted tiles, mosaics, stones on there to give an idea of what the final piece will look like. Uh, you may have seen this, this is this was the alligator, uh, became known as the Nikki Gator. Before going to um, Jerusalem where the installation was, uh, the pieces, several of the pieces were put on the lawn in Balboa Park outside the Mingay. And the Nikki Gator was by far the most popular with kids and stuff. So afterwards, Nikki thought, well, 
we should do another one and make a second one and give it to the Mingay. So this normally lives outside the Mingay. The second one does. Uh, Dave and I did a series of chairs uh, based on bird chairs with breast, ironically, and this was one of them. Uh, Nikki later decided to do one for one of her friends, uh, Marina, who's of European royalty. So because of that, we decided that it was decided this one should have a crown. So I did a crown gold leaf that went on the bird. This is Marina in her chair. Uh, Dave and I did a whole series of snake mirrors. And it turns out Nikki had done snake mirrors before. We never saw them. So we kind of had to, we came up with our own interpretation with her. And these were all sculpted in wood and then painted or dyed. And this is one of them. And I'll ha I have some pictures in a few minutes uh, showing some of them under construction. Um, Nikki's biggest project in San Diego was Queen Cliffia's garden. This was up to be sited up in Escondido. If you haven't been there, it's an incredible experience. It's uh, almost an acre of sculpture garden. Um, Nikki uh, called me on a Sunday night at 10 o'clock and said, I've just got a clay model going of this. Can you come over right away at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night and help me with it? So I went over and she had this stuck to her floor. This is plasticine clay. And so the next day we pried it off and I started making a model of that. I think Dave worked on the center figures and I worked on the snake wall. And the model was to be used to, as a guide to building it and also as a way of showing it to the community and get you know approval for this and everything. This was a very large piece that needed to go through a lot of boards and approvals to get built. Here, once I had the model built, Nikki had a pallet of stones and clays and everything that she would use to cover the piece in. And they're in these uh, boxes here with numbers assigned to them. So Nikki would go along and put the numbers on the piece. And then another artist would come along and paint those in. And here's the final piece of the area she was just working on. These are actual gemstones and other stuff. Uh, the circle was 120 feet in diameter. What, what's that, Dave? Uh, the circle was 100 and is 120 feet in diameter. Yeah. So this was built and the model was done and no sooner did I get it done, she says, I need another one. Uh, turns out they didn't have any architectural drawings or anything for building plans for foundations, any of that stuff that you normally need for a commercial project. So down on the floor, you'll see a second copy of this that was made. And this was done exactly to scale as the above. And this was back in, uh, I think, 98, 99, maybe 2000. And technology was just getting going. So it had to go up to LA to, to a 3D scanner. And from that, they were then able to produce the plans. So it was kind of a reverse process. Most things start with plans and models are built. So this went backwards. This is the completed garden. And that's Queen Califia on top of the uh, winged bird here. And many other figures in there. So, um, Back to the snake chairs. That's ultimately what I want to talk about here. Nikki had done a lot of chairs over the years. These are some chairs that she did in Italy. And they're, they're very interesting, but they are not comfortable in the least. Uh, so knowing that I was a chair builder, I said, well, I can help you with making a chair comfortable. Uh, but we have to, uh, there are certain points that a chair has to touch you to be comfortable. Other than that, you're kind of free to do what you want. So this was an early version that Nikki had done of a snake chair. And again, you can see that probably not that comfortable, but uh, an interesting chair. So we decided we'd have a, a meeting. Mario was, Bodo was in town. So the three of us got together to decide what a snake chair really should be. And Mario thought it was very important that the chair itself be defined by the snakes and the serpents. 
uh, the legs, the back, the arms, everything should be snakes. But the seat itself would be totally independent. So with that in mind, I gave Nikki uh, some copper tubing. I put a um, piece of plywood in the copper tubing, attached it, and I said, okay, this, has, this seat has to sit at this height here. It has to be on this angle. The back needs to touch it here. The arm needs to be this high. Other than that, you can take this and do whatever you want with it. So Nikki bent the copper, shaped it, and then covered it in clay and came up with this clay model of what the first snake chair was to look like. And she gave this to me and then became the problem of how to make this in wood. If you notice down at the bottom leg there, uh, that offset in the leg, any way you try and do that in normal woodworking would crack unless you had, you know, multiple joints through it. So keeping that in mind, what was decided, the chair would be divided into three parts. There'd be the back, which consisted of the two back legs and the heads, one leg, and then one leg with an arm. And this was the first chair. So patterns were made and in the patterns, there's a final pattern on top here, which is the final shape that it's cut out to. And then there's a rough in pattern. The rough in patterns underneath here. And that's the pieces of wood that we would lay up initially to make the chair. I then ordered a whole bunch of uh, soft maple. And we chose soft maple because number one, it was fairly easy to work with. It wasn't very expensive. And it, Nikki was gonna want these colored at the end. So the soft maple is fairly light colored so that it wouldn't affect the dyes that much. Um, so we laid up a series of pieces like this from the pattern. This is an example of the back. And I would take the grain and all the grain would go about 30 degree bias on half the pieces. The other half, the grain would flip over to the opposite bias. So it'd be going 30 degrees the other way. Those were then stacked and with epoxy became essentially a sheet of plywood practically. And so you can see here in this stack here, this is just five, but the grain alternating, they were stacked up Here's an example of one of the layers. Uh, in this case, this is one of the mirrors that Dave was making, but it, the same principle. Now this stack of laminations, this is big. It's, it's three inches thick. Uh, it was laid up with slow setting epoxy, which meant I had about an hour, hour and a half working time. And I built this huge form underneath here that was strong backs, massive, really, bolted together that I could then bend this form over. This piece was laid onto the top center, clamped down, and then I would start bending the ends in. Had to work fast because I only had an hour to get this together. And when it was done, it had about 150 clamps on it. Uh, you notice that this side and this side aren't necessarily at the same elevation. So the, form, the jig was such that these pieces would wander over the jig at different heights. So these were clamped independently. You couldn't just put bars and clamp the whole thing in a vacuum bag. Uh, this was very stressful to do this, but uh, we got, got it down. This is Dave gluing one of the mirrors together. It's a similar process. There's no oh my God. Bit bending here. <laughs> um, the snake chairs themselves had about twice as many clamps. So not only did you have to be ready to go, you had to have all the clamps open, clean, laid out, ready to reach. So everything was right there to do it quickly. Uh, the side arms were the same type thing. They were built on a small radius. There was a slight arc to them, but this minimized how much wood we had to carve and cut away by doing this and it made it stronger. Up at the top here where you had a weak point, the grains, uh, this joint here, on half of them would be down here, on the other half it would be up here. That then created, a, in the laminations, a finger joint. Uh, same thing down here is that half these pieces would be going this way and half would be going this way. So, then I had a, would take the next size patterns, lay that on top of it once everything had dried, 
draw the uh, cut shape. And these pieces were then cut out in a bandsaw. And I had to get a big 20 inch bandsaw to handle these because they're really big and unwieldy. After they were cut out in profile, then I started a series of cuts and grinding in the side view down here to get the secondary shapes. So it created a square shape of the snake. Then I went through and drew 45s on it. But because the snake wasn't perfectly round, sometimes this 45 might be large, this one might be very small, and it would vary as I went along. But I had the model as a guide and I would look at it and watch, okay, how much do I need to take off? Yeah. From there, it would start a series of grinding to get to the round shape. Here's the uh, some glued up snake mirrors showing you at that point just before the uh, uh, secondary cuts are made. This was one of the main tools we used a lot of. These are cut saws. Uh, sometimes for really coarse removal, I might use the chainsaw cutter, but this was much easier to control and left a fair, not too rough of a surface. Uh, then the next step would be going to these pneumatic sanders. This is an inflatable drum. They come in different sizes. I'll show you another one here in a minute. And you can inflate the pressure in them depending on how much uh, curvature you had. And these are really good for shaping curved surfaces. They smooth it out very nicely without leaving dips and uh, dives. You do have to move them around a lot. Uh, I constantly use them on a, uh, a bias where I'll come down with one angle rotating it and then I'll rotate it uh, 45 degrees and come at a different angle and that way I don't get the dips and bumps in the wood. Uh, the power source here is a pneumatic air tool. This is an air drill. It's low speed. This You don't want a high speed on this because it would just fly apart on you. Here's one of the pieces. Uh, this is one of the leg arm components uh, that's been rough shaped. So after many weeks of work, I, over three weeks, I finally got the first snake chair. And this is what I came up with. And you'll notice the seat, the, arm, the legs themselves, the back, that's the structure of the chair. The seat sets in there. There's uh, four quarter inch, number 14, four inch screws through here that uh, locate the seat. And then there's uh, anodized aluminum standoffs here that uh, are recessed into each piece that basically hide the screw. This is then put in afterwards, so it's a separate component. It ties the legs together, but it really just provides a seat. So everything else is snake other than the seat. Hmm. Here's one of the finished chairs. Dave would come in on a lot of these and he did most of the inset of the Marinis. The Marinis are these uh, melted uh, globulates of Italian glass that one of Nikki's artists in Europe would make. And we had various sizes of these. We'd take these to Nikki. She would look at her inventory and say, okay, put this one here. And she would uh, mark them and then Dave would grind these out and we'd set them in there. In, in some places there's mirrors, lots of different uh, tech uh, pieces. Uh, Dave found eyes, I believe from a duck uh, carving place. And so we got different eyes for the snakes. Here's uh, another one. Go ahead. Yeah, Nikki wanted the eyes to be different on every snake. So uh, I had done a lot of duck carving, so um, was able to find a lot of ready-made glass eyes, but um, it was kind of a challenge to work with some materials that I'd never worked with before. So I used ABS and rods and, and sheets and blocks and uh, fashioned uh, eyes out of, out of them. Um, so uh, just in terms of, uh, in, I think for both Dell and I, it was a chance to really stretch our knowledge of uh, ways to go about things that we've never done before. Well, the snake, yeah, everything in the snake chair at the time was just not the normal way you would do anything. So it all had to kind of do it on the fly here. Uh, now, having, 
getting back to that green chair, I took that over to Nikki. Nikki said, that's great, I love it. Now, the museum is opening in two months. I need 12 of them. <laughs> and this one took uh, over three weeks just to build. And I said, well, there's no way I can do that. So I got, D Dave got involved in it. Uh, Ed Cornett, so some of you may know him. He was a former member. And then a friend of my wife's, Ellen Gibson, she flew out from Boston. And the, uh, and the four of us went together making chairs as fast as we could. And different people took different parts. Ed did a lot of the painting uh, or the finishing. Uh, the finish on these is aniline dyes. And each uh, the aniline dyes were assigned to the chair and then clear coated with a uh, acrylic lacquer. The seats were typically all black. So again, the seats were independent of the chair. Uh, so in two months, we were able to produce 12 chairs. And it was a long two months, but we got them done. And this is the first batch with Nikki getting ready to be shipped out to uh, the opening of the gallery. Uh, took all these chairs down to a uh, for freight forwarding house and put them into a uh, LCD as a container that goes in the belly of a plane. And I was just able to get all 12 of them in one container and shipped them off to Basel, Switzerland. And this is two of the chairs in the museum a few years ago. This is over, that's the Rhine River and the, through the windows there. And this museum was dedicated to Nikki's partner, John Tingley, who did a lot of large kinetic sculptures. And Nikki and him worked together for many years and produced a lot of incredible pieces together. So uh, she was also very active in the, getting the museum put together here. Uh, and finally, uh, this is Nikki's uh, get your mom. Yeah. Uh, dining room. And uh, this is uh, where we would have our meetings. These were ch chairs that Dave and I had built over the years. And uh, this was a typical uh, afternoon lunch. Uh, just when Nikki died, I was working with her on a new design. We're going to do a new table. And she was friends with uh, uh, Dr. Watson, the uh, Watson Crick. So we're trying to work out a design where the lay, what core of the table would be a double helix out of snakes coming up to support the table. But it only became a concept. It never actually got built. So something I would love to do someday, but uh, it got left there. So uh, I'm going to go to some, let's see, as soon as I figure, I uh, had to get out of here. My, yeah, okay. My tech person's left for a minute, but I'm going to show you some stuff here in the room where I've, you know, things I've done for Nikki, some actual pieces. And uh, one second. Okay. So I'm going to just bring this camera with me myself. All right. So this is a chair that I've made since then. And uh, you'll see, this is built like the snake chairs. The arms and legs and back are all glued together. And uh, structurally, all that is fine by itself. And the seat simply floats with these uh, screws and spacers in it. So this was the same process we used in the snake chairs. Here's one of the pieces I showed you earlier. I think I got it. And this is one of the pieces we were working on. This one unfortunately got dropped in the process. So there's a crack here. That's why I have it. Um, my sander. Here's one of the tools I use for shaping these. This is one of the pneumatic sanders. This, they come in different sizes. And this could fit in here, and you can really get in here and work these areas. Uh, you can start with maybe a 60 grit for shaping, go to a 120, and then a 180 for final sanding. And this is pretty much the way these chairs were done entirely with, with these tools. There wasn't that much handwork. Uh, the mouse and everything were done with grinders and stuff. Uh, structure it, I should mention that the arms and legs did go on with traditional mortise and tenon joints. So that was the only traditional thing about these chairs, but the rest of it was all lamination. 
Uh, over here, after the chairs were done, Nikki decided that uh, she was starting to have grandkids at that point, and the grandkids should have snake chairs. So we came up with a child's rocker, and this is one of them. And this did not use the lamination like the other chairs. It was small enough we didn't need to. But uh, it's very similar to the snakes, except it's on a rocker. And the rocker helps kind of structurally tie this together. But you can see some of the uh, detail of some of these beads and glass that were put in. Here's the marini beads. And the eyes. Uh, so, also a few other things, uh, some of the bird chairs we did, this was a maquette for one of them, here's, here's a different Del? version. Del, yeah. I just want to give you some feedback because you can, you don't have the benefit of watching this, but we're able to see all these close-ups and it's really great. So you're not hearing anything from us, but it's looking great. So I just wanted to give you at least some feedback because it's otherwise it's kind of quiet on your side. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, one of the bird chairs I did, an interesting story here, I think I can tell, uh, got it all done and it had the breasts like many of the bird chairs did and Nikki decided she didn't want breasts on that particular chair. So I have to admit I was probably the first, first person to ever do a complete mammillary resection of a bird. <laughs> this is the pieces I removed. These were some uh, initial study pieces for the Noah's Ark. Uh, there's a large bear that you can walk into. Uh, this here, little tiny thing, was the dove that uh, flew out at the end of the cruise. This, in this case, there's an egg inside the back of the dove. So, uh, just a quick tour. This is my office here. Uh, as you can see, I was doing snakes before I met Nikki. It was kind of a strange psychic connection. <laughs> Uh, these are some chairs I did that are called earthquake chairs. They're hanging on the ceiling, so if they look upside down, they are. Uh, they're chairs that are in, uh, going through an earthquake. All right. uh, there's some more over there. Cradle, rocker, snakes, more snakes. There's lots of snakes around here. And there's some Mexican folk art here. Allie Bree has. Uh, oh, one other thing I was going to show you, just is how I use some of the stuff, I, you know, from working with Nikki. Okay. You can see it. I've got a light in the way of what I want to show. So this is a piece. Uh, okay. Anyway, I, I just used some of the mirrored pieces in, the, in this uh, piece here I did some years back, so. Okay, I'm open for questions. Huh? The, uh, I noticed some bells or chunks maybe in the corner. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, the whole wall of cups there. Is that something that she did or is that something you're doing on your own? Would you say that again, Dave? Hi, right, Mike. Uh, the, the, they look like cups, but they, they you use them as child. Oh, oh yeah. Um, one of my hobbies is uh, making music with Tibetan bowls. Oh. These are brass bowls. Uh. Oh, nice. And they have a nice tone. Hey, just for everybody's information, you're all unmuted now, and uh, Dell says he's ready to take questions. So if I, would, if I could just impose with a question at the beginning, Dell, I've been up to the Queen Khalifa thing, I don't know, five times, and I'm always just peering through the cracks and trying to see what it's like. Other than like the twice per month, if you happen to be there between 12 and 2 or whatever ridiculous few hours there are, are there any events that you know of so you can actually see the thing? I, I think, there, uh, yeah, I don't know what the current hours on it. They had some problems with vandalism because it's, it's in a very remote corner of the park there. And so it's, it's a little hard to protect it, but uh, it is, I think, open when there's uh, some sort of guard or, you know, guides there. They do have guided tours from time to time. And if you mm -hmm. never, uh, I would check in with the Escondido uh, Arts Council. They, they uh, I think, manage it. 
Um, yeah. By the way, I, I wanted to mention Lecture Inco, who may be in the meeting here. Uh, he did, pretty much built the garden itself. He's a ceramicist. And, oh, yeah. It says here the garden will be open Tuesday to Thursday, 9 to noon, weather permitting. So it's a limited. Oh, oh is, is that just Christmas? No, no, no. And then it's the second and fourth Saturdays of the month from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Yeah. Or that only hours it's open. That, that was a difficult project because Nikki initially wanted so many things she wanted to do. Um, the first thing to go in the garden, it was a maze to get in the garden. And so we started modeling this maze, which were all these mirrored walls. And it was very confusing visually. And then the question came up, well, how do you make a maze ADA compliant? You know, it's, it's like an oxymoron. So we had to work with that and uh, a lot of issues like that to make the park, you know, friendly and everything, but at the same time to keep the artistic value of it. It's really amazing to see. Dell, this is Pete Sterling. Yeah. Hey, uh, just a quick uh, couple of comments. Um, <clears throat> I am just um, blown away with the skill and your talent in doing this stuff. I mean, I knew that uh, you were a creative guy, but uh, working with her and doing the kinds of uh, wood construction that you guys created was astounding. And I, I mean, it's just an incredible body of work that you produced, it really is. It's okay. obviously, it's not everybody's style, but uh, the, the, the body of work that behind it is incredible. So, well, Nick, Nikki had a way of challenging people. It's like to step up and go beyond what you've done and what you can do. And I, it was a wonderful opportunity to get in that position. Right. Yeah, just the chairs alone. I think, uh, Dell, as I recall, the, the classic snake chair, I think, oh, over time, I think it was about 35 of them maybe that were built. Uh, I believe it was. Um, Somewhere between 50 and 60. I have an inventory here somewhere. Oh, wow. I didn't mention that the initial 12 and they're on. Not only did Nikki need 12 chairs, but everyone was different. Yeah. So there were no <laughs> Small two, details, two. <laughs> Yes. Of course they were. Of course <laughs> they were. There was the succeeding generation of uh, state that were. Uh, yeah. Made I think there's still, what, a couple in the Mingay, Del? Uh, I think there are. Um, the snake chairs themselves, there are not very many around. There's several of the birds, though. And, oh, there's some, there's some other snake chairs I didn't show you. There's, they're um, like a snake kind of coiled and with uh, one or two heads coming off of that. And the Mingay has one of those. That's a much larger piece, very heavy. And there were owl chairs too, the, the bird chairs. Yeah. Those were kind of fun. The, the uh, back of the head were negative space with uh, mirror inlays, little segments of mirror. It's really, really cool. Yeah, this was one of the first bird chairs. Uh, yeah. Initially, it was going to have wings on it. Oh, initially, this was going to have wings on it. And so that's why they're in clay. And so I started making wings and I still have some frames from the wings out in the yard, but Nikki decided she didn't want them. So the chairs basically became this structure without the wings. And of course they varied from piece to piece. Uh, this was a simple, the back was straight laminations this way. There was a big mortise and tenon joint down here at the tail and then the seat mortised in with the legs uh, cutting into it. Uh, Dell, I had a question on some of the big structures that they, you were making the, 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 with the snake chairs, where she was covering uh, copper pipe with clay. Was that baked then, or was that fired afterwards? No, no, it was soft. And uh, I, that's, I have a clay piece here that they don't hold up. I mean, they just fall apart in yeah. no time. But it was just a quick way for her to, you know, communicate with me of what she had in mind of shape and stuff and I could then copy that. Okay. You know, Nikki wasn't somebody that gave you a drawing 
and and sometimes it would be just okay make it make it look like mine you know <laughs> here's my style but uh in this is one of the few a uh, few of these cases she actually gave us maquettes to work from well you worked with her from 95 to 2003 2002 yeah 2002 seven years and, and so that was a obviously a big influence on you from that point forward but before that, what, what did you specialize in, in terms of the woodworking you really wanted to deliver to the world before you got in touch with Nikki and took this club past? I was doing a lot of chairs at the time. Oh, and, okay. And that's why, that's why this led into the chairs very nicely. Got it. You know, I, under, I understood what a chair needed to do to be comfortable. And Nikki just, she said flat out that, you know, my chairs are horribly uncomfortable. <laughs> let's, let's see if we can... And we, we tried another version of the snake chairs I didn't show you, where I took kind of a chair that I was doing at the time and we put some snakes on it, but it just didn't work. And so that's why we got together with Mario and the three of us just talked it out of, you know, what a snake chair should be. And that's where we came up with the uh, clay maquette you saw. Here's a, a clay of a bear that, uh, and this was the uh, plastilina of clay uh, with an armature of uh, heavy wire. And so we would uh, play maquettes from Nikki or one of our artists, and then we would convert that into wood, you know, just make a wood carving of it, and then it got gessoed and painted up by uh, Nikki's painters. So those were, you know, that's how we modeled things out. What, what, what was her process like? Because it sounded as though she had this like a uh, suite of people that she would turn to. It would be the painters, the people back in Italy who did her tile, you guys for the construction of the chairs and other wooden structures. Did she have like this loose confederation that was her army? Yeah, there were, there were about 50, 50 or more artists around the world. That wow. There was a crew in... Belgium, I think, and one in Italy, and France, and Bahia. So basically relationships she built wherever she was living and then just kept, kept those up. Yeah. Uh, one of the great things about Nikki for everybody, you know, uh, it made her productive and it was great for us too, is she loved to collaborate to make something and um, she, it was very generous in terms of accepting ideas, you know, uh, from all of us. Uh, so, yeah, it was really rather amazing experience. And she was not trained in architecture or art or anything like that, isn't that right? No, she was, she was just started doing it in uh, Paris, I think. Huh. Cool. If you're reading history on it, it's quite a history. There's just a, a lot of things she's done. She's one of the, you know, premier women artists at the time. There were no women artists that really stood out, I think, in the 60s, 70s. Um, one of the things I, I, Dave was talking about how collaborative she was. When we were doing the uh, garden, the uh, tarot garden, I'm sorry, the Queen Caliphia's garden, I had built that whole model. We took it over. We used it for scale to look at it, see how people fit into it, what was going to work, what wasn't going to work. And there was one part on the wall where it was too low. The kids could easily climb, scamper over. So it was supposed to be, first of all, a wall. So she says, well, raise that part back up. And I had this made in pretty much four pieces. So that involved cutting a lot of, making a lot of new snake and just a, lo a lot of work. So I just said on the cuff, I says, Nikki, why don't I, how about doing a baby snake on the back of the mother snake here? And Nikki's just, great, just do it. <laughs> so I got, to, you know, that baby snake was like, okay, I created my own baby snake and put it on there, so. Hey, so I would say, gee, what do you think? And, um, and she, oh, how do you think it should be? So. How about other people out there? You got questions for uh, Dell and David about this experience with Nikki? Some of the art? I'm not 
seeing any questions. No, but the mics are open. People can go ahead and um, ask questions if they like. Yeah, uh, Colleen, are you trying to make a question? Yeah, you might want to comment on how the great big sculptures were done. Uh, the process, the, you know, the CAD scanning and the frames and the skin and all that. Well, initially, Nikki did a lot of pieces when she was in Europe out of styrofoam. And that was part of her issues in later life is the styrene fumes were very toxic. So uh, with the pieces here, what would be done is those pieces would, we would do the maquettes, the small models of it, and then Lex crew would take them and they would take wire frames and do the large size in wire. It was then covered in, I believe, fiberglass. Um, I think, yeah, I think there was a fiberglass resin that went over it. And I, I may be wrong on that, but to create a shell and, but it was a hard shell. And then once that was done, then they would then start applying the tiles and uh, decorative pieces. Yeah, the masonry, masonry is quite a trick because, you know, this has to stand up to the weather and those tiles have to stay, you know, have to, have to stick on. So once again, um, there was a lot of uh, study that went into the materials and the pizzas that were used and the fillers that were used, uh, you know, to, you didn't want any shrinking and cracking and didn't want it to cut loose and it be waterproof. We also had to use special silicones because uh, a lot of the glass she used was mirrored glass and ordinary silicone has acetic acid in it and that'll pull the mirror off. So. We had to use a special uh, mm -hmm. uh, silk on 795, I believe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, David, when was the last time you saw Queen Khalifa? Oh, my. Probably about uh, 18 years ago, maybe. Oh, that's a while. Well, she's still there waiting for you. <laughs> I've got hundreds of pictures of that whole process too. And you guys built not only one scale model, but two. Is that what I heard at one point in the yeah. story? Why was that again? Uh, Noah's Ark, uh, there were a couple of sets of uh, animals who were done. Uh, Dell, I think, did one. I did another. And as a matter of fact, it was the first thing I ever did in you know working with Dell. Um, I needed some, uh, some little figures to cut out and uh, Del knew that I had a scroll saw and he, had, he had a week to get an entertainment center out and he said, can you do this for me? So I, I worked on that. I, I ended up cutting them out of acrylic and then I scanned the black and white um, uh, artwork from Nikki into the computer and used label stock and did mirror images and I'd stick, you know, these are like black and white Escher type. Uh, anyway, I'd stick one on one side, one on the other, because they were opposing, and um, there were holes to, uh, she loved negative space, so all I had to do to make a hole was just to cut the label out and the acrylic clear. Uh, hey, I, Del, I say think something. this is so one that, of them. Yeah. Yeah. Say something again, Del, so it switches to you. We didn't get a chance okay. to see it. Okay, I think this is one of the ones that Dave's talking about. This is one that Dave did. Oh. Um, okay. You were talking about two sets. The Queen Califia had two sets of models. The reason being is that the first one was a model to uh, paint the colors on, paint the tiles, to establish the design and get the scale. But the second one was in order to make blueprints. We had no blueprints for the site. You had to get approval, code, oh. all those issues. And so Nick, you know, nobody in the, in the group was an architect. So it was sent up to LA it was scanned and then an architectural firm rendered site drawings for grading, concrete work, foundation, all that sort of thing. Great. I don't know whatever happened to the second one. The, the uh, painted one was on display at a show a few years ago. So it's still with the foundation here in town. So Del, if you were gonna say where in San Diego County people could still go see her work, I think you already mentioned the Mengay. Mengay. The Queen Califia uh, site. 
There are some statues on UCSD's campus. Where one, else? One statue on UCSD. Yeah. And then there's the coming together down by the ballpark. There's it's still there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And I think that's, there's, there, like I said, there's several outside Bengay. There's a couple others other than the Nikki Gator. But, uh, and then inside they have several, quite a few pieces. What, what would the world say was the kind of art she did? What did they call it? Uh, well, I, th I think she fell, I mean, in the general category of a modern artist. Okay. Three dimensional modern artist. Yeah, Nikki started out, uh, a lot of her early stuff was uh, composite stuff, uh, collages, multiple pieces uh, attached to each other. Oh, I gotta get a picture of that one. Figurines. And then she became uh, very famous back in the 60s. She did a series of shooting paintings where she would take uh, canvases and hide paints behind the canvases and then shoot them. And wait, wait, like bang, bang? With a gun, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in, she did sculpture of uh, Khrushchev and Kennedy and a bunch of the world leaders and then shot them. So, so there are these, these wall-like constructions and there were bags of paint in back of them. So when the, you know, when the bullet hit the sculpture. Yeah. <laughs> these, these became events, you know. You know it's celebrities all would come to these and it'd be quite, quite the event. Huh. Yeah, she would use a rifle and, um, you know, I guess way back then, uh, you know, you're famous when somebody posterizes you. There was a uh, French post that showed her, her stance with her rifle. Oh. Huh. She could, could see the, the, the con construction up ahead and her shooting. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, she was uh, pretty much out of the box. She made movies. Uh, just, you know. Mm. Well, I've had the chance now to see you speak of her, Dave, and I've heard several opportunities to hear Dell speak of her. You are very fond of her. Oh yeah, you know it, it was, you know, it was really a loss for everybody. Yeah, got it. Well, uh, I don't know if you had anything else in the agenda, uh, Dell, but Mike, was there anything else you wanted to add on to this before we round it up? I'm, I'm. Perfectly happy with what's going on. I think uh, Dell did a terrific job, and Genevieve, Absolutely. And Genevieve ran the show uh, nicely. And, uh... yeah, there we go. Applause. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Genevieve. Amazing. Hey, and Genevieve too. Yes. Hey, Dell. Thanks so much for sharing that whole story with us. I mean, I didn't actually even know about Nikki until you told me about her, and then I went and did some research and realized that she had touched my life in various ways without even knowing it primarily from the Hanging Angel and the Queen Califia statues. But mm -hmm. uh, it was great to be able to see your work now that I know you had a hand in all that stuff. That's really cool. Some, some, oh, yeah. I mean, Nikki was one of the most prolific artists of the uh, 20th century. So, you know, I did a, a lot of pieces for her, but by comparison, she did a monument of pieces before sure. and with other people and other stuff, so. There were millions and millions of dollars worth of art that came out of her studio. I mean, it's unbelievable. And she and she was she would monetize everything from the start of the project and the maquettes and the drawings and the you know uh, wall hanging versions of it. Uh, you know, she'd work her way up to the main piece, and all those other things were saleable. You know, I have here. Uh, uh, um, a little higher than that she did. A and, higher, higher uh, so we can see it. Is it okay? Uh, uh. There we go. Okay, this is just one of a couple posters we have here, but these are uh, pieces that she's done. And this was when she first came to San Diego. This is a trip to the desert, and she has all sorts of little figures down here from the desert. And there's a, I think there's a snake, and there's a spider, and there's a, a blue dog. So. That's her, what she, you know, she saw in the desert. She, <laughs> she was very generous too. Uh, you know, for Christmas, she would give Dill and I, uh, you know, say, well, there'd be a whole uh, cabinet full of uh, different lithographs that from mm -hmm. anything she had done. And she said, well, pick one that you like. 
for Christmas tree. That's great. That's I'm great. looking at a wall. It's got three of them right now, and uh, treasures. There was one other woodworker working with her. Um, she wanted to do a piece uh, that uh, I forget the reason. It didn't seem appropriate to what I did. It was more of a marquetry piece. So Pat Edwards did a screen with her using his marquetry techniques. Uh, and it was the three dancers uh, from um, uh, Monet, the dancers. Oh, I know the picture. I don't know, remember who did yeah. it. Yeah. Anyway, Nikki had her own version of that. And so Pat did a piece, one piece for her. That's cool. That's great. Well, uh, if, if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and wind up. But Dell, this was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for kicking off our Woodworker Spotlight and Mike for hosting it. We'll uh, figure out what we do next, but probably in a couple of weeks, we'll try to line up another uh, guest. And Dell, we want to lean on you because you know everybody and uh, we can bring new, new faces in every once in a while. Good. Great. Glad Thank you, everybody. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.